This is Political Radar Pulse with Rhonda Sitnikau, where we explore the issues facing Northeast Wisconsin and beyond with insightful interviews and open discussions. Hey, all you political junkies, welcome to Political Radar Pulse, the best 30 minutes of unscripted and uncensored political talk you will hear all day. We have an election coming up on April 4th, and there are two referendum questions on the ballot. And here to discuss this with me today is the president of the Green Bay Area Public School Board, Brenda Warren. Welcome to the show. Thank you. Thanks for having me. Okay, so the referendum obviously is something that's really important to get out and vote um, for, against, however you feel about it. Um, and this is, I would think it'd be fair to, question to ask, is this the first time that Green Bay has seen this happen, or has it been a while? We, we went to referendum about three years ago in 2014, and that was for a um, facilities referendum. And really the focus of that referendum was to upgrade our heating, ventilation, um, air conditioning in a, in a number of our schools, and we added some safe and secure entrances. Now this referendum has two questions, which is very different than what we've done before. <clears throat> we have a facilities referendum, again, which is touching 18 of our school buildings and addresses things like overcrowding, mostly on the Far East side, safe safe and secure entrances. We're finishing the last seven elementary schools that um, haven't had a safe, safe and secure entrance built for them. And we are adding some space for some a few of our programs. The What's new to the referendum is the operational referendum. This is the first time our district has gone out for an operational referendum. What that is, is, is giving us, the school board, the authority to increase revenue above the state-imposed revenue limit for our district. And that's, the revenue limit is what we live under. It's, it's the, the level that we can um, uh, levy property taxes above what the state gives us. So the state gives us about two-thirds of our revenue limit, and then the property taxpayers pay about a third of that revenue limit. Our revenue limit is um, about $9,600, which is actually about $16.5 million less than the state average for revenue limits. And $16.5 million is what you're asking for with the Correct. referendum. And what about the facilities referendum? What is that price? That one is $68.25 million. And what's important to know with both these referenda is, questions is that if both of them were to pass, there will be no increase in the tax rate. And the reason we can do that is because historically our district has managed our debt in a way that we have debt that's falling off this year that we're paying back and we have and we can insert new debt into that space and have the tax rate be consistently the same as last year. So you've been out there talking about this referendum in, in multiple places. Yes. And and so what's the feedback right now? What are you hearing about it? Um, we're hearing mostly good things. I mean there's um, I think people that have come to our presentations and we've been out in the community, uh, I think we have over 70 presentations that we will have given when all is said and done. And most people, when they listen to our story and hear the work that we've done to come up with these two referendum questions, appreciate that work. We've had community input. We had a community task force to give us advice on what they thought our pressing needs were and, and to tell us what they thought we should do. And we've we had three uh, school board meetings where we really worked on the the questions that we were considering putting on the ballot. And we we had three different iterations of what the referendum would look like. And in between the first two meetings, we went out and, and got more community feedback from parents. And then the the uh, next iteration was different in, in response to the feedback we were getting. So this is a collaboration of parents and community members that have dis discussed what, what the needs are. Correct. Yeah. And it's really, I think people are recognizing that what's on this referendum is, is things that are, that are um, needs for us right now. We didn't go out and build um, any, any new buildings that we, that we don't actually need at this point. Okay. So I'm looking at the, actually um, some of the information. So the capacity needs, that's, that takes the biggest chunk out of the referendum as far as the numbers go. What, right. Um, can we talk about some of that specifically? You know, some of the schools um, that are that mentioned on here are Baird, Dan's, Eisenhower, Jackson, Martin, Sullivan, Edison, and Red Smith. And um, Sullivan, uh, Martin Elementary, Jackson, Eisenhower, Dan's, Baird. Those are elementary schools. Middle schools are Edison and um, is Red Smith a middle it's school? It's a K-8. It's K-8, okay. Eight grade, yeah. Okay, so this is lower um, education, I guess, if you want to say. It's not a high school referendum. Correct. Okay, and so what are some of the things, um, can you give us some examples of some of these schools and 
of what you're looking at to, to change or to upgrade? Yeah. Well, currently, Baird is the biggest project on there. It's a $25 million um, school building. It's the only brand new building that we would be building. And we're building it on the site where Baird currently is. Baird is an old building. It was built in the time when open classrooms were in vogue. And we've retrofitted that that school, put walls in to make it more of the traditional style of teaching. But it has very odd-shaped rooms, um, and the school is built for about 300 students. Right now there's 420 students um, in there. And and uh, so we're, the cost to remodel and to, re- to fit that school is more than half the cost of building a new one. So that's the point at which people would advise you to go ahead and replace So it's really a value to do it this Correct. way. Correct. Right. Okay. And, and we're what? adding, we're actually adding about a um, t- couple hundred spaces to Baird because we know that there's this large plot of land out on the far east side that's ripe for development. And so the, the students in the, in the Green Bay um, portion of that land would attend Baird School. And so we're, we're preparing ourselves for, for when that development does happen, that we do have some space for elementary kids at Baird. And then we're building four uh, classrooms over at Red Smith in the middle school because the students at Baird also go to Red Smith. Okay, and then what about the safety and security needs? Um, that's five point three million of the referendum money would be put towards that. Right. It's really all about when when uh, you know right now our elementary schools are locked and you have to you know get permission to enter the school. But in these last seven schools, when you enter the school, you aren't funneled immediately into the office like you are in our other schools. And that's really the the security part of that entrance is when you come into the school, the only way you can go is into the office, and then. And then the office person finds out what you need and then buzzes you into the school at large. So that's really what we're talking about. And some of it is is small dollar amounts because it's um, a, an easier fix and others are a little bit more. But that's the that'll be the last seven of our elementary schools. Then we'll, they'll all have that kind of a, a, a secure entrance. Which sounds great, actually, yeah, as a yeah. parent. Um, obviously, that sounds like a good plan. So the adequate and appropriate spaces is eleven point four five million dollars. Um, can we talk about what what that was going to be? Yeah, we have there are three big uh, areas that we're addressing there. One is our fine arts space. We have a, a fine arts institute at East High School, and it's actually a kindergarten through twelfth grade program. It starts at Webster and to Washington and at East. And that program actually was uh, uh, started by our community. Um, they wanted a program like this for students to be able to get private lessons that normally wouldn't be able to afford that so they can take their music um, to a new level. They've given us almost a million dollars in donations, the fine arts board and community. And we are just um, making sure that the spaces in our school are meeting the needs of that program. So that'll be a uh, um, additional space at Webster, Washington, and East. And mostly it's uh, space within the school building itself. Um, Webster actually will get a new uh, cafeteria. Right now they use their gym and cafeteria. The gym is the cafeteria. So they'll get a cafeteria that can also um, be used as a performance area there. So, um, uh, and then our, the second is our John Dewey Academy of Learning, which is a project-based high school. And that's currently housed at um, in a rental space. St. Peter and Paul School, and the the facility needs are not addressing the needs of that program. We we haven't been able to to um, do to that building what needs to be done in order to really have that program thrive, and so we've uh, set aside two point five million dollars for that program. We may put it in one of our existing buildings, or we may find another site that's that we purchase. So that hasn't been determined yet. And this is basically a you know these are just to function. Like Correct. right, literally right. just to go to go to school and function um, right. as as children, as parents, um, you know, sending their kids to school, and they know that they're, you know, they're able to do yes. the best they can when they're there, and then teachers as well, obviously. Right. Yeah, and the community space is the third thing on that list, and that's we have a lot of community services that come into our school. Probably the biggest and most well known one is the oral health partnerships. They've been coming into our school for many years. That's a nonprofit organization that donates time to help give kids um, dental care that they can't access otherwise in the community. There's other community services that come in and our schools weren't built to, to house community services. So what we're looking at is creating a very flexible space for that. We want it to be a space that works for oral health partners, but also space that might work for other community Where are they partners. doing that right now? 
sometimes uh, in the library, in classrooms, we have a few of them that are in the hallway um, at how they actually have the how neighborhood resource center. So that's, they have um, better space over there, but it's, it's, it's a, uh, you know, it's temporary space. They come in, they bring their stuff, they, they provide services. And then so they some leave. of this is actually happening in the hallway in, in a couple of our schools. Wow. Yes. Yeah. Okay. Well, that's, that's interesting. Yeah. I'm yeah, sure we for make, the kids as well. They're yeah, probably right. well. They set up, you know, a partition and, sure. and uh, try to, to keep that privacy. But it, but uh, you know, we've made it work. But we have a lot of, you know, a lot of need in our in our, our student need in our district. And so we're looking at we're working with the mental health coalition in town, trying to figure out how to provide mental health services better for our students. And so that's another community service that may come in and provide that kind of care. Uh, and I think it's important to know that we aren't paying for dental care for our students. We're just providing the space. That's all c that comes in and, and is provided by community donations and, and uh, things like that. And so are you prepared to um, consider the fact that maybe these won't pass? And what would happen if they, if, if that actually, if they didn't go through, what would happen? Well, I think, you know, right now we have on the far east side, we have schools that are that are very crowded and we would continue with crowded schools. Um, and then we have uh, four and five year old kindergartners who are in rental space. And the community task force said very strongly that they think we need to get out of rental space because we aren't able to make that space our own and 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 have have the right spaces for our students and so we would have to continue renting that space um, instead of bringing home what what we're doing with some of the space we're creating is bringing those four and five year old kindergartners that are off-site back into their neighborhood schools we think that's good for students and we all it's good for families to be able to just have that one k through five uh, elementary experience in one school what happens then if let's you know people they don't show up they don't show up to vote for the, the referendum or it, it doesn't pass or I mean is like are you prepared to to address that what would happen can you walk us through like what would happen if, if this doesn't go through I think well the facilities we would just have to limp through with you know what we're doing now um, not so nothing will change I mean as far as like what you have projected here and what you'd like to do that that won't be happening correct correct okay. none of what's on that list for facilities okay. we'll, we would be able to do and then the operational referendum, if, if that were not to pass, then um, we would have to make some pretty substantial budget cuts. We're looking at an $18 million budget deficit for next year. So that's the by far the biggest budget deficit. And that translates to jobs. That, yeah, it's our 80% of our budget is people. And so we've been cutting for uh, as long as I've been on the school board, almost every year we've cut um, cut from our budget. And and we've cut kind of in that 20% that don't necessarily directly affect students, but you can only cut that for so long before then you're faced with cutting people. And yeah, we're looking at about 150 um, staff across all of our employee groups um, we would have to cut. And of course, when you cut staff, then then we are looking at uh, cutting programs, services to our students, all those kinds of things. And we really feel like we're on a very good trajectory in our school district. We've had a lot of really good successes and a lot of very, very strong programs that are that are um, effective. We have some work um workforce development programs that our community has invested in. And, and so they find those programs extremely valuable. And those are giving um, some, uh, students an area of interest. You know, they can really dive into areas that they're interested in in terms of developing themselves for, for uh, their future careers. And then as far as, you know, you said there, there may be loss of jobs, would there ever be a possibility of larger class sizes? Would that happen? It could, sure, yeah. I mean, it's a, you know, the the fewer teachers you have, the more children you you put in classrooms. And I don't know, you know, we'd have to look at that in terms of do we cut whole programs or do we do we cut um, teachers in areas where you know then we're able to put more kids in a classroom. So those kinds of decisions have not been made and would not be made until we have to face that decision. Because I mean, is you know, and you obviously know about this more than I do. The population is increasing, so it's not like it's. I mean, our our city is growing. Correct. Yeah. And um, and the area outside the city is growing. So obviously, we have to make adjustments. Yeah, we have to accommodate for that. Right, right, and it's it, and again the 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 space that we're creating, the majority of the space that we're creating is for students that already sit in our in our schools. So we're not making large spaces that aren't going to be immediately filled when they're done. 
And um, so that's, I think, important to know. And we, we have, our district is a growing district. Uh, we, we grow a couple hundred a, a year on average, um, I, maybe a little less in the me- recent years, but we definitely are not declining in enrollment. So that's important to know that we, we have those kids and it's critical that we educate all of our children because they become the workforce and contributing members to our community. And and, and that's, you know, segueing into, we're always trying to attract, retain, uh, you know, and attract and retain talent, young talent into the area. And if we want to grow our city and expand and, um, you know, really be competitive, we have to accommodate for people that will have children that are coming into, the, into right. the area. And so really, if you're a person that's out there, that's, you know, that, that really buys into that and understands that, that, you know, that, that entire narrative, then you, you really do need to come out and vote for this referendum or, or these referendums because that does connect together. Correct. Yeah. I think there's, you know, I mean, the economic vitality and development in your community is directly related to your workforce and your workforce comes from your schools. And, and so if you want to attract, you know, companies come into your community because they can see you have really good schools and they feel confident that down the pike they will have employees that they can hire to, to work in their company. So I think it is, it, it is important. And, I, and, you know, for families with children, that's one of the first things on their list is to start looking at the community schools. And I think if, you know, we need strong community schools in Green Bay if we're expected to have, a, you know, a, a vital economic um, community. And you do have to invest in them at some point. I know people want you to just continue to cut, cut, cut everything. Right. But eventually you do have to invest in yeah, them. Yeah, yeah. And I think, you know, a lot, some people will say as they're, um, you know, that these are the, as they get older, these these people are going to be our doctors, our nurses, our plumbers, our electricians, the, the people that will take care of us. And so I think we do need to invest in essentially the future workforce in, in our community. And it also affects your your property value, um, not only the value, but your ability to sell your house when you're ready to sell your house. There's strong schools in the area. You're much more likely to sell your house to a to a family coming in that that wants their kids to go to that school. The real estate agents have a vested interest in this as well. Sure, we could go across uh, probably quite a few um, people in the community and different professions and economic classes, and really everyone does reap the benefits of us investing sure. in schools. Yeah. yeah. I mean, I think strong communities are directly reflected on how strong your schools are. Absolutely. Um, is there anything else you want to add or talk about in regards to the referendums? Um, I think with the operational referendum, I just want to uh, clarify that um, the reason, one of the big reasons we're going out for operational referendum is that our state funding and the, that revenue limit has not kept pace with inflation. So we've, that's the reason we've had to cut. Um, in order to continue programs that we have, our revenue needs go up, but, our, but the revenue we get from the state and property taxes does not keep pace with those needs. And so, um, and there's, there's no doubt at the state level, they're, they're looking at equity and funding and, and trying to figure out how to better fund schools. Because the referendum, our referendum limit and everybody's referendum limit in the state was set in 1993. And the way they set it was whatever you were spending in 1992, that was your revenue limit. And so we were a low spending area. Actually, nine of 10 Brown County schools are below the, uh, below the average for revenue limit. And there was no mechanism in that in that legislation to figure out, make sure that that schools, you know, get to the point of of some kind of equity. There's also no, um, there's there's not a a way of determining what the needs of your students are based on your costs. And and because uh, right now every student across the board gets the same amount per w- with that revenue limit. And so and what is that? What is it like cost per student? Do you have that factored in at um, all? No, not not off the top of my head. In just, terms I'm of, just curious, like yeah, what's, if there's well, an average nine, cost per student. Well, the, the state average is 10,444. Okay. That's the revenue yeah. limit. Um, it doesn't necessarily reflect all of our costs because we also get federal funding. We get some um, a little bit of state funding for our ELL pay, uh, uh, students. And, and things like that. But that is the, you know, comparing across the state, that's everybody's base is that revenue limit. Um, and so we're, so the $9,600 per student that we get is, is, six, is, is a total of $16.5 million less when you, yeah. um, you know, when you multiply that by our 21,000 students. So it's about, you know, $800 less than the state average um, 
per student. And and what do you expect is, you know, in regards to, I know I keep being the Debbie Downer of this conversation about, you know, what if it doesn't happen? Mm-hmm. So where would this take you, you know, the next time around, let's say in, in two more years, mm-hmm. when you would possibly try to do this again? We would probably, for sure, the facilities referendum. We would, and would it be the same price or would this actually increase? Well, the construction costs are going up. Right. You know, and that's... Um, it's uh, and actually projected to go up um, fairly quickly. So, so the um, the first project we would tackle actually is Baird because it's our biggest our biggest cost. So that we can get in when the construction construction costs are a little bit lower than they will be in the next year or two. So, um, you know, so that's a, a critical factor too as well. So, um, and the the other thing back to the operational referendum too is that ours sunsets after 10 years. So we're asking for $16.5 million authority to levy above the revenue limit. But after 10 years, we would have to come back to the taxpayers. If we still needed that money, we'd have to come back to the taxpayers and, and ask for a vote to be taken. We're hoping, we set it for 10 because we're really hoping over the next you know five, six years that they'll be able to figure out that equity and funding piece. And then we'd be in much better situation in terms of being able to meet the needs of our students. That sounds like it. Anything else you want to add? Um, and how can people get in touch with you if they need to? Um, they have it, more questions um, about the referendum or anything else. And is there any, I would also ask, is there anything coming up that they could attend in regards to getting more information if they um, wanted to? Any yeah, we've, sessions or we anything? We had community sessions last week. We don't have any more of those scheduled. Um, we're pretty much winding down in terms of our, in terms of our um, community presentations. But one way, though, we have a, a tremendous amount of information on our website. It's gb, gbaps.org slash referendum. That has our community task force report. We had a facilities master plan done. It's That's in there. All the community feedback that we've been getting is in there if people are interested in looking at that. And then the handouts that we've been providing at our community sessions are also on that website. So there's lots and lots of information. There's also a sp- place on that website to contact Someone, if you have a question, or um, you're certainly welcome to contact me or any of the other school board members, too. Okay, and we'll include that, that in the okay. show notes as well. So that wraps up uh, the first episode of Political Radar Pulse. Um, please go to politicalradarpulse.com slash one um, for show notes. And if you're watching this episode on YouTube, do not forget to like, subscribe, and hit the bell to get notifications. Also, if you would like to support the show, you can share this episode on Facebook and Twitter, and you can buy shirts or other merchandise at politicalradar.com slash shop. Thanks a lot. Thank you. Thank you for watching Political Radar Pulse. To ensure that you'll never miss an episode, subscribe on YouTube or your favorite podcast app. To check out more episodes of Political Radar Pulse, visit politicalradarpulse.com or connect with us on Facebook or Twitter.